जी बसमीम सो टुडे आई एम गोइंग टू टॉक अबाउट ओरल कॉन्ट्रसेप्टिव पिल्स एंड आई गिव अ बैकग्राउंड अबाउट हाउ इट वॉज हाउ दीज ओ सी पीज वर डिवेलप्ड एंड वॉट इज द डिफरेंट क्लासिफिकेशन the mechanism of action their clinical uses of course a long list of side effects some minor side effects and some major effects which are of concerns and their risks and uh, what are the major contraindications ocps uh, are also you know a good topic and uh, slight with a slight difference uh, in with, uh, when we discuss menopause so i'm not really going to touch menopause here but uh, there will be some the the discussion related to the side effects the risk contraindication will uh, probably imply on that as well so uh, combined estrogen progesterone or oral contraceptives the cocs so i'm going to refer the combined oral contraceptive with coc throughout my lecture today also known as birth control pills they provide reliable contraception as well as non contraceptive benefits uh the ocps they contain an estrogen component and one of a dozen different progestins low dose uh, ocps with formulations which contain less than 50 microgram of ethinyl estradiol they are a safe and reliable contraceptive option for the majority of women for healthy non smoking women the ocps may be continued until the age of menopause so you see this uh, the these OCP, ocps when uh, they are taken as a choice for menopause or you know in in conditions of pre menopause or premature ovarian insufficiency or where you need to treat uh, a woman or a female for hormone replacement uh, with regards to you know um, i mean hypogonadism or Uh, premature ovarian failure and so on in that case the 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 ocps can be continued until the age of menopause and this is a consensus of several guidelines several of the international guidelines so uh, this is how the ocps are classified uh, based on the formulation either a combined pill or or you get a estrogen only pill the estro uh, sorry progesterone only pill and the the purpose of you know uh, sharing here that this is a combination pill and progesterone only pill is for the purpose of contraception the estrogen only pills are not considered as contraceptive pills themselves because they need a progesterone component anyway and uh, then based on the dose and type they are the combination pills they are classified as first generation second generation third generation pill and i'm going to explain what is the meaning of these generation and how and what is the difference between them then based on the dosing regime how you prescribe them uh, they can be independently classified as monophasic or multiphasic and then multiphasic has a uh, biphasic and triphasic as well and cyclical regimes and continuous regimes continuous regimes can be uh, extended regimes or can be quarterly based again depending on the various formulations available so um combination pills obviously combination means there is an estrogen and there is a progesterone the estrogen in most combined preparations are the second generation uh, that is mostly in the second generation pills is the ethinyl estradiol although a few preparations may contain mestranol instead so these are the two main estrogen components or estrogen um, uh, compounds which are present in the combined pills in the majority of ocps the progesterone uh, may be a norethestrone and the levonorgestrel ethinodiol or in as in third generation pills i'm going to explain later uh desogestrel or norgestimide which are more potent have less androgenic action and can cause less changes in the lipoprotein metabolism which is a lot of concern with related to the progesterones in general uh but which probably cause a greater risk of thromboembolism than the second generation preparations so once you get to know what are the generations then you will be able to understand about the progesterone in detail but these are the ones which are mostly used in the combinations so here comes the first generation pill uh the development of ocp actually began with the isolation of progesterone in the first instance and 
this uh, this isolation of progesterone was very expensive and a difficult procedure to do so in the past. So a compound with the name of ethesterone, which is a derivative of an of an androgen and has a progestin activity as well, was easier to isolate, and this was discovered. Um, with the removal of a carbon 19 on this ethestron, the progestational activity was increased, and the new compound was then termed norethendrone. So this was the you know, first synthetic form of uh, progest progestogen, which was then you know, utilized from time to time as, a, as the main um, progesterone of any of the OCPs. And then uh, during the process of norethendrone purification, an estrogen contaminant was found. And when, when this contaminant was removed from that compound, women would experience breakthrough bleeding. So what happened that the estrogen was added back, thereby creating the first generation combination birth control pill, which was first approved by FDA in 1960. So you see, this was how the first generation pill was developed. First, the progestogen was developed. And from that, they found that there is an estrogen, which is important to be in, to be the part of it. So they, they you know, labeled that as the combination birth control pill. And uh, the, the first generation pills, they contain more than 50 micrograms of ethinyl estradiol or mestrolol and a progestin. So the, the main uh, feature which you have to learn for the first generation pill is that they have, they, obviously they are all combination pills. The, the estrogen component has, the dose is more than 50 micrograms. This is important, okay? So this high dose estrogen was associated with adverse events such as coronary thrombosis. So then they develop a second generation pill which has less than 50 microgram ethanol estrada. So this is the differentiating point between the two uh, generation from first generation to second generation. You came to know how the first generation pill was developed, but then you you then now um, now you're classifying it because now you are you know decreasing the dose from of one component or the other. So this is how the second generation is developed. And coming to the next, uh, that is the third generation. So attention was then directed towards the progestin. Progestins have adverse androgenic effects such as affecting lipid metabolism and glucose, intoler glucose tolerance. So this led to the development of third generation pill that contain both a lower dose of estrogen that has to be less than 50, that is 20 to 30 or maybe now 35, of ethanol estradiol and newer progestins. Uh, they are the broad category is the gonanes, which is visogestrel or norgestimate. This development of third generation will then re uh, result in the reduction in the metabolic changes associated with these progestins. And but the limited data which is there in the studies show there is, uh, I mean, there is no, I mean, sufficient data to say there is a reduction in the cardiovascular events, but but obviously the, the metabolic changes are well addressed through this development of this generation pill. And then there is an unclassified type of, um, you can say um, combination pill, which has uh, the progestin component of which is recently developed called drospirinon. And this has an anti-mentral corticoid and uh, anti-androgenic activity in addition to its pharmacological gestational effects. This is an analog of spironolactone, which competitive, competitively binds to aldosterone receptors, uh, so that there is no uh, stimulation of the renin angiotensin aldosterone system, which results in more stable weight and less water retention. Um, however, the anti-androgenic activity of this spironolactone compound is less than the cipotron acetate or spironolactone itself, which, which one may use for the purpose of, you know, hyperandrogenism in, in conditions like PCOS for the treatment of hirsutism or acne. So it will have a good contraceptive efficacy, less uh, progesterone-related side effects, um, but it may not be very suitable if you want to use it for the purpose of anti-androgenism as, as, you know, is clinically indicated. So broad classification of progestins, which are used in com combined oral contraceptive pills in the various generation, the first generation, second generation, third, and then unclassified. 
So norethindrone, as I has explained earlier, and these are the so other first generation progestins. Second generation include the levonorgestrel still being used. Um, third generation has desogestrel and so on, and the unclassified type that is the drospirenone and ciprotron. So the ciprotron is used in one of the famous which we use is Dyn35. And uh, I believe drospirenone is used in Yaz. Uh, this is the classification of progestin, which is again uh, relate, uh, based on structurally related to testosterone and then structurally related, more related to the test uh, progesterone itself. So those related to testosterone can be ethanylated and non-ethanylated. Uh, the ones with are, which are ethanylated include estrains and 13 ethyl gonanes. And these are the ones uh, that I mentioned earlier about gonanes. These are the newer ones. And uh, coming to the um, related to progesterone, we have ciprotron. I think you can learn the main famous ones which, are, which we mostly use in our clinical practice. Obviously, this is still not sufficient. There are still more, uh, I mean, number of uh, various compounds which I have more, may not have put up here. But uh, uh, it's just, you know, a simple idea of how to classify them, how to look into them. Now let's start with how do you prescri prescribe these medications and how they are classified based on that. Monophasic versus multiphasic. So what is phase? Initially, I explained about generations. Here we are talking about phase, okay? Phases, uh, phasic preparations were speculated to decrease the amount of total progestin which you give throughout, you know, um, a prescribed regime, say a cycle, month or so. And the reason was that to reduce the metabolic changes, uh, decreasing the adverse effects related to the progestin, reduce the unscheduled bleeding which is related to it. And obviously there are business related reasons as well, market competition, patent expiration. Uh, there are no data as such that these preparations have any important clinical advantages from one type of phasic preparation over the other. And the contraceptive efficacy appears to be similar across all types. Uh, biphasic formulations may be associated with more unscheduled bleeding compared with the triphasic pills and that they are, therefore they are not used. In fact, I would say the biophasic and triphasic both are not being used as such. Uh, mostly the monophasic ones are used and the trials have shown that there is no such major differences over regarding the, you know, the clinical efficacy and so on. So let's go through what are these phasic pills supposed to be. Uh, in the monophasic pill, each tablet contains a fixed amount of estrogen and progestin. So that is why it is called monophasic, okay? The dose of well, the, both the components are fixed throughout the prescription regime or um, uh, the cycle and so on. The traditional monophasic pill, for example, low estrin, it contains 30 microgram of ethanol estradiol and 1.5 milligram of norethindrone. This dose is given every day for three weeks and with one week hormone free interval. The progestin dose remains constant throughout the cycle and other examples of this is like Yaz, Yasmin, and Dine 35. Okay, so uh, other examples are in front of you, and you can understand how they are prescribed and how do they function, and what is the amount of each, each of the component, uh, what, what dose of each of the component is there. In the biophysical, there is the each tablet contains a fixed amount of estrogen, while the amount of progestin increases in the second half of the cycle. That is why it is called. Biophysic. So the progestin is given in two types of doses, but in, in phase, okay? For example, in orthonovum, which is 10 by 11. So the 10 by 11 indicates here that, okay, I'll explain, which contains 35 microgram of phenyl estradiol and either 0 0.5 or 1 milligram of norethindrone. The 0 0.5 milligram of norethindrone is administered during the first 10 days of the month. That is why it is 10 and the one milligram is administered for the following 11 days. That's why it's called 10 by 11. So there can be various combinations of these um, uh, pills, uh, uh, that, that type of pill that with 10 by 11, 10 by 10, 11 by 10 and so on. But the last seven days of the cycle are kept free of hormones similar to the monophasic type of uh, regime. And so you here you understand that the amount of progestin is divided into two halves. 
This combination resulted in a theoretical increase in breakthrough bleeding and an increased pregnancy rate, okay? So why did that happen? Because the estrogen component may have taken over the progestin component while changing the dose of the progestin in the, in the whole phase. So this was not very much, you know, favorable and not favored by, by the patient and by the clinician. So that's why that I mentioned that biophysic pill is not being used now. The triphasic pill, the amount of estrogen here is fixed or it can be variable as well, while the amount of progestin increases in three equal phases. So in triphasic pill, you can also have a variable estrogen uh, dose, but the triphase word is for progestin because that is divided into equal three phases and three equal phases and uh, the dose is divided according, the, 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 the formulation is divided, is, is uh, devised accordingly. So for example, triphasal or orthonovum 777 means it contains 0 0.5, 0 0.75, and one milligram of norethindrone combined with 35 microgram of ethanol and stradiol. So for seven days, you will give 0 0.5. For the other seven days, you'll give, give 0 0.75. And for the next seven days, you'll give one milligram. And the last seven days will be kept hormone free. Other regimes which alter estrogen doses, they aim to simulate the estrogenic cycle actually. Uh, and possibly decrease the breakthrough bleeding. So you see the breakthrough bleeding component or the unscheduled bleeding is all blamed because of the estrogen component. And uh, that's why they have devised uh, the, the drug to you know, alter the estrogen doses among them as well, like triphasal 30. 30 means 30 microgram, triphasal 40 would have a 40 microgram, and again, and so on. Theoretically, this formulation improves the cycle control, but again, um, trials and data has shown no, no such differences as, as such. So this was about the phasic regime, monophasic versus multiphasic pill regime, which is mostly prescribed. Um, the, the monophasic one is the one which is mostly prescribed. Uh, now we come to the cyclical pill regime. Uh, this cyclical pack, pill pack, typically provide hormone pills for 21 days of a 28-day cycle. And obviously, this includes the monophasic, biophasic, or triphasic dosing regimes. And this is followed by seven days of placebo pills that result in a withdrawal bleed. This is also known as a 21-7 regime. So the cyclical pill regime is a classification which describes how the pills are prescribed in a cycle. Okay, cycle means menstrual cycle. And that is just to explain the woman that uh, this is this is your normal cycle, and this is just you have to take the pill according to your cycle, so she can uh, you know accept the pill uh, for the compliance, or and that will result result in proper contraception. And obviously, this cyclical pill regime include all the the combination regimes, and uh, obviously the generations the, the the phasic regime also imply into it. An alternative type of regime is 24-4 regime, which provides four days of placebo or a low-dose estrogen pills. The shorter the pill-free window, the less likely it is that follicular genesis will occur. So the estrogen component is, is you know, important for prevention of this follicular genesis. Uh, that's why they have, uh, you know, uh, given that four days of low-dose estrogen for that in that window as well. This provides a month. Now, this cyclical regime, cyclical pill regime, provides a monthly bleed to the to the woman, which she interprets as a normal menstruation. And in this way, this uh, the, the the pill acceptance is increased and compliance is increased, and women is reassured that she is not getting pregnant. So you see, these are all uh, typical, uh, you know, prescribing. Uh, um, we can say prescribing methods and uh, uh, manufacturing techniques, which led to you know acceptance by the population as a whole. Then, with a standard um, seven-day pill-free interval, follicles may develop and secrete enough estradiol to repair or stimulate uh, proliferation of the endometrium. That is normal consequence of the progestin in the pill. But with a four-day pill-free interval, endometrial atrophy may become more likely, which can result in more unscheduled bleeding in early cycles. So 
This, however, this was, would increase effective contraception anyway and reduce the symptoms which are associated with the hormone withdrawal, for example, mood symptoms, headache, and pelvic pain. So seven-day pill-free interval is considered as a long interval and during which there is a chance that endometrial repair can happen and there can be a chance of pregnancy. So for that reason, the four-day pill-free interval is considered better. Uh, but again, as I said, the estrogen would be increasing in that uh, regime of the 24-4-day regime. And that would result in more unscheduled bleeding. Um, but again, presence of estrogen will be more helpful to reduce symptoms of hormone withdrawal. Now coming to the continuous pill regime. Continuous or extended cycle uh, OCP regimes allow the user to choose when she will have a withdrawal bleed, okay? With continuous regime, the patient takes a combined estrogen progestin pill every day for a year. And with the extended cycle preparations, which are similar to the continuous regimes, except that the seven-day intervals of placebo or low-dose estrogen is administered, um, and they are inserted approximately every three months. So it is called 84-7 regime or quarterly regime, or somewhere you may uh, come across with 91-day regime as well. Uh, and that is not, that 91 day is actually equal to this uh, 84 7 regime, but in that 91 day, there is a seven day component which is pill free, okay, uh, or, or has a placebo in that. So uh, basically, you know, previously uh, there was a thought that a woman who's not menstruating is not normal. So one should have a menstruation. But with the passage of time and how this, the, the uh, different uh, I mean, societies in the world, they understood the concept of menstruation and the risk of endometrial hyperplasia of not having a menstruation. Uh, at minimum quarter of, you know, I mean, minimum three month interval has been allowed. And that is the reason of the extended cycle preparation regime that after three months, if a woman does not want to have a menstruation, she should have at least, um, if she wants, she desire that she should not have an endometrial hyperplasia as well, then, three-month quarterly regime is the one which suits her. But with the continuous regime, she can plan when she can have a, a, a menstruation or may, maybe she does not have if she doesn't have that risk. These formulations, they are packaged so that the three-month supply can be easily dispensed at one time in a convenient package. So you see, these are all different pill regimes, pill uh, designs, how they are prescribed. And then again, a progestin only, progesterone only pill, which is also very important. And this is different from the combination pills I've explained so far. Okay, till now there were combination pills. Uh, pills have both estrogen and progestin component. This is the one which is only which has only progestin. So they include norethestrone, levonorgestrel, ethinodiol, and medroxyprogesterone acetate. The pill is taken daily without interruption. And the progestin only pill may be started on any day, and there are no pill free days. Since progestin is the only hormonal ingredient, estrogen related side effects are avoided. Uh, but they, as they do not include estrogen, so therefore there's a high failure rate related to contraception. Uh, and then users must take this pill at the same time daily for the greatest effectiveness. Okay. So this is the progestin only pill. And a little bit about emergency hormonal contraception. Uh, basically, uh, it is levonorgestrel, which contains a high dose of estrogen. You see, this is 100, uh, 1500 microgram, that is 1.5 milligrams. And it is taken as soon as possible after an unprotected intercourse, up to seven, two hours, and preferably within, seven, within 12 hours for the effective contraception to happen. Otherwise, it's not very effective and there is a high chance of pregnancy. Now, how do you start a person on a contraception or a combination of or on OCP as a whole? How do you prescribe them? How do you know begin for any uh, prescription? Um, OCPs can be started anytime during the cycle as long as pregnancy is reasonably excluded. And there are several options for starting the pill. So overall, uh, it said that you can start it from any time. It's not that when did you had last menses or when did you had your last uh, period and so on. You can just prescribe and ask the patient to take it from the day she visits you. So quick start method in which the woman begins taking OCP on the day that is she is given. 
this approach is evidence based and well uh, reported and then there is a sunday start approach where the women start the pill on the first sunday after her period begins patient should be informed that a sunday start avoids the withdrawal bleed happening on a weekend and she can decide if that is a priority so you know there are there's still more techniques but i just mentioned the two of them which were more famous but overall what they mentioned was that it can be given any time during and during the cycle phase when these options are adopted the pill is often started more than 5 days after the onset of menses so sometimes when the patient really asks you that which day of the cycle you can just simply say okay start it from the fifth day but actually it doesn't matter and the evidence says that there is no such a difference when uh, if, if on which day the, the cycle of the cycle the pill is started uh, and how these ocps actually work hormone birth control medications to prevent pregnancy through the following disease these this, this is all mostly theoretically you may all be very well aware just to go through quickly there are various methods of how they are achieving contraception obviously by blocking the ovulation how does this happen estrogen inhibits the fsh secretion where negative feedback on the anterior pituitary the estrogen component of the ocp and it suppresses the development of the ovarian follicle the progestin component inhibits the secretion of lh and thus prevents ovulation so this is how they block the ovulation by altering mucus in the cervix progestin also makes cervical mucus less uh, suitable for the passage of sperm Uh, by changing the endometrium, estrogen and progestin act in concert to alter the endometrium to discourage implantation, and by altering the fallopian tubes, that is, interference with the coordinated contraction of the cervix, uterus, fallopian tubes, that facilitates fertilization and implantation. So this is all very much uh, the background basics of how these hormones work. Uh, now coming to the non-contraceptive uses. uh obviously ocps they are contraceptive but there are non contraceptive clinical uses which i want to discuss today uh menstrual cycle disorders uh, ocps are often used in women with menstrual cycle disorders such as oligomenorrhea due to pcos abnormal uterine bleeding which improve results in improvement of uh, in the iron deficiency anemia in such patients then uh, there are there are menstrual migraines where you can you know prescribe them uh premenstrual syndrome or premenstrual dysphoric disorder again this can also be uh, the reason you can prescribe the ocps although the ocps are not the first line therapy for such condition then pelvic pain disorders women with pelvic pain for related to endometriosis or chronic pelvic pain conditions or dysmenorrhea often benefit from the hormonal and the endometrial suppression associated with the ocp use to reduce the their symptoms in such condition continuous or extended cycle ocp are often more effective obviously the there will be a continuous supply of hormones so they, they are found to be more effective ovarian cysts ocps are found to uh, are often prescribed to women with a history of painful ovarian cysts to suppress ovulation and subsequent formation of new cysts but they do not appear to aid regression of existing functional ovarian cysts which are more, more common in young uh, adolescent females so i mean that is not the reason you prescribe these ocps however in in slightly older women you can prescribe them or uh, i mean mostly these are gynecological indications so i mean uh, they have to taken you know well uh, care of under consideration of ruling out malignancy and so on for hyperandrogenism uh, ocps can reduce the dermatological manifestation of hyperandrogenism that is acne and hirsutism especially in women with PCOS or non-classic CEH due to 21 hydroxylase deficiency. Then, as a hormone replacement, which I, um, I mean, uh, I touched earlier as well, that they can be used in women with primary hypogonadism or premature ovarian insufficiency and management of menopausal symptoms in the perimenopausal women, for example, hot flushes and so on. <coughs> then they help in cancer risk reduction as well uh, women at increased risk of endometrial and ovarian cancer can benefit from ocps to reduce their cancer risk as well as to provide a highly effective contraceptive uh, there is a similar reduction in risk for women with brca1 and brca2 ovarian cancers um, although a history of ocp use has been associated with reduced reduce risk of colorectal cancer in some studies the body of evidence conflicts and it is not known if prophylactic use of ocp reduces the colorectal cancer risk so i am going to explain this uh, effect of can of on cancer development later as a as part of the side effects and risk risk 
management. Just a bit, a bit you know, light on how, where they can be used. For bone health in perimenopausal women who use OCPs have improved bone density compared to the non-users. And they've also been shown to reduce the postmenopausal hip fracture incidence. OCPs are also useful for the treatment of hot flashes and abnormal uterine bleeding in this population. Besides, there is a reduction in the occurrence of ectopic pregnancy, and then there is a reduction in the risk of having benign breast disease with OCP use as well. Now coming to the side effects. There are minor side effects, and then there will be major effects, which I'm going to explain uh, from, you know, topic-wise. The weight gain, which is owing to the fluid retention on an anabolic effect of both, is very much of a concern of a woman that after using the OCP, I've started to gain weight and so on. But the evidence says that use of OCPs does not appear to result in significant weight change, either gain or loss. So you have to reassure every time from diet and lifestyle and so on, if, if the OCP is so much desired. Then nausea, breast tenderness, flushing, headaches, they are usually minor and frequent complaints, less than 10% of the women. And um, they happen after the OCPs are started, immediately after they are started. And then uh, they, they obviously they decrease with the with the use uh, when the patient continue to use them over time. They, these side effects go away, and with the current formulations, they are even lesser reported. Other side effects are dizziness, depression, irritability. Then there can be skin changes, but they are not uh, of much clinical concern, and they take less priority if the, if the desire of OCP is much of benefit. Then unscheduled bleeding, um, also known as breakthrough bleeding, the most common early side effect, affects 50% of women during the first cycle. And then it's, this also quickly improves over the subsequent cycles. Does not signify decreased contraceptive efficacy because women may consider that uh, this she may be getting pregnant and this is an unscheduled bleeding for that reason. So you have to reassure. Then formulations with 20 microgram ethanol estradiol or 24-4 do dosing regime. Uh, that is the 24 days of pills and four days of placebo, they are associated with the higher rates of unscheduled bleeding than formulation with more than 30 micrograms of ethanol estradiol and a 21 day, 27 day OCP regime respectively. So you see, we are mostly using the 21 7 regime and mostly we, are, we have the ethanol estradiol, which is 30 and 35 in our, our OCP prescriptions. Then amenorrhea, this usually occurs intentionally with the continuous and extended OCP regimes, right? But it may occur unintentionally with the 21-7 or 24-4 cycling, uh, cyclic dosing schedules. So this again does not signify decreased contraceptive effectiveness as long as the medications are taken correctly, religiously, and consistently. Uh, for the reassurance of a monthly uh, withdrawal bleed, one option is to increase the estrogen component in the OCP, but this is not evidence base. So, I mean, that is the only reason, the, the estrogen is the only reason which is uh, uh, responsible for this unscheduled reason, uh, bleeding. We can reassure and tell the patient about it. May also occur after discontinuation of the OCV, but this is not a consequence of OCV use itself and does not indicate an ovulation that the normal menses have not resumed or there's a chance of subfertility or patient is not able to conceive for that. But if um, you know this is happening for a longer time, so it is important that to rule out other endocrine, uh, other underlying abnormalities, and evaluate the women who do not menstruate after 90 days from discontinuing of the OCP. That is the three months. Okay, so give a three month time to the patient that okay, uh, if you're not having uh, your regular cycles, just wait, carry on, and you can after three months still she has this complaint of amenorrhea, then you have to work out. What is the reason? Now I'm going to uh, describe about the major side effects or major risk of health concerns, which have a lot of debate and studies and you know trials gone through in the world. So OCP use does not appear to impact the overall mortality based on the large longitudinal studies of the women. Uh, but older age, that is more than 35 years, and tobacco use increase the mortality risk in OCP users. And this has long been known. So any risk of increased mortality would not really directly imply to the OCP use itself unless the patient is overage and is also of a smoker. Mostly the smokers have been studied. So here I have a report, I have mentioned three main large studies which are done on large population of women. 
and were of larger duration, like more than 30 years, they have been studied and followed up. And the population here, and they, they obviously uh, compared the OCP users versus non-OCP users, but uh, each one of these studies have their unique property in, the, in that some in, some, in one of them, they compared smokers with non-smokers. In the other, they found to have, uh, 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 have risk reduction in cancers, actually. I think this was the Royal College study. And uh, again, in this nurses health study, they found no association as, uh, as such reported between the use of you know, OCP and non-OCP users, any, any risk of mortality as such. So the, the relative risk, which I've mentioned here, of 0 0.89, 0 0.88 is the, the risk here whatsoever is not because of the OCP itself, but due to the effect of smoking and other lifestyle factors and, um, um, and uh, about the cancer related mortality, which is, which is apart from OCP use. So the, there's no effect on the overall all cause mortality. So the cardiovascular effects related to the hypertension, OCP may cause a mild elevation in blood pressure within the normal uh, range. However, overt hypertension is unusual. Um, before initiating OCP in a patient, high blood pressure should be excluded, properly measured, and treated. And even with the OCP use, initially, every six months, you should measure the blood pressure of the woman. Uh, venous thromboembolism, obviously the risk is increased. The relative risk of VTE has been reported in so OCP users to be three to four, five fold increase. Now, if we talk about L uh, absolute versus relative risk, um, absolute risk is, is 0 0.06 per 100 pill years, greatest in the first few months of use and lower than in the pregnancy and early postpartum period. So the absolute risk is higher among women with thrombophilia, smoking, obesity, PCOS, older age, and immobilization, but not in the um, healthy young women who does not have other risk factors for uh, venous thromboembolism. There's an impact of progestin on, component on the VTE risk. Evidence suggests that progestin component affects thrombosis risk along with estrogen, but the data are not very much con consistent, and the thrombosis risk appears to be lower with the second generation OCP uh, than the third generation one, because third generation ones are more advanced kind of um, progestins, have more advanced progestin that is desogestrel and gestadone, gestadine. The risk is higher with the unclassified OCP. So, you know, as the generation developed, the unclassified came into existence, that is a nilocorticoid derived progestational company, that is a prospironone. This is the one which, is with the high, which has a higher risk of uh, having the VTE. Coming to the myocardial infarction and stroke reduction in estrogen content since initial OCP introduction has increased safety till date. Now, you know, as the estrogen component has been reduced with the passage of time, so the safety overall has been reassured. But there's an absolute risk of stroke in young women, which is low, uh, 5 to 10 per 100,000 women years, as I mean, in general population. This risk doubles in women who are OCP users. Generally, the stroke risk is increased in OCP users. And as with VTE events, the absolute risk of arterial thrombotic event are lower with the OCP users than during either pregnancy or the, or the postpartum period. So if in a woman who is taking OCP, and if you compare the risk of having a thrombotic event uh, in, from the woman's point, point of view that she's getting pregnant or getting in a, is in a postpartum period, Compared to that, the OCP use is less. The, the risk is uh, less with the OCP use. Then the risk of myocardial infarction stroke associated with OCP reported in uh, a 1.6 times higher overall risk of arterial thrombosis among OCP users compared with non-users. The risk appeared to increase with higher estrogen doses and did not vary by progestin type. Compounds containing levonorgestrel and 30 microgram of estrogen appear to be the safest. So overall, there is a risk related to myocardial infarction and stroke, but you have to, again, uh, assess individual risk from various other risk factors point of view. Lipid changes and metabolic effects. OCP users can negatively um, impact lipid and carbohydrate metabolism, especially in the subgroup of women with PCOS. And it basically, OCPs they raise serum triglycerides by about 25 milligram per deciliter after, the, after six months of use. 
Uh, but this has been found to be not very much clinically significant in otherwise healthy women who do not have other risk factors of concern. For example, if they are not overweight, obese, they are not hypertensive. Uh, so they, this, would, this in slight raise T, serum TG, triglycerides, not of much concern. Modern formulation of pills do not impact the LDL and HDL levels. And there are comparable or even milder effects on triglycerides, concentrations, and insulin sensitivity if you, if you compare the, the contraceptive type between oral contraceptives uh, and transdermal or monthly vaginal ring. Okay, so there is no much difference to that as well. So it's not that uh, oral nalia, you don't take oral OCPs, rather take transdermal or monthly, it's not like that. So there's not much difference for that. Women with pre-existing dyslipidemia would have an increased risk of cardiovascular events and weak E, but the evidence is poor and the effect is minimal. We cannot say it if that is because of the OCP use. OCP increase plasma insulin and glucose levels and reduce insulin sensitivity, but effects are negligible for current formulations and among women of normal weight without PCOS use. So you see a woman would have an other underlying risk factor and majority uh, of the studies have reported PCOS is one of them. So it's very important from our population point of view that we are seeing a lot of such cases where PCOS is there. And we should be very much concerned about, you know, because we are prescribing OCPs to them, uh, concerned about these metabolic risk factors. So obviously we have to, you know, take care of their weight, lifestyle and so on. That has to be really stressed. Uh, no evidence that OCP use influences the risk of developing diabetes so far. Um, that's it. I think that's the, so far, these were the cardiovascular and metabolic related uh, issues. Then there is an uh, eligibility criteria defined by WHO that these women are eligible, medically eligible, where you can give contraceptive, uh, oral contraceptive especially. And there are, these are divided into four categories. Uh, category one is a condition for which there is no restriction for the use of contraceptive method. Category two is condition for which advantages of the use generally outweigh the theoretical or proven risk. Category three is a condition for which the theoretical or proven risk is usually uh, outweighing the advantages of use of using the method of contraception. Whereas category four is a condition that represents an unacceptable health risk if the contraceptive method is used. So you see category one is safest and category four is where you don't have to you know, prescribe the OCP. And based on this criteria, some medical conditions represent an unacceptable health risk. So these are the absolute contraindications where you don't have to prescribe OCP to these women, age having more than five years and smoking more than 15 cigarettes per day. Uh, having two or more risk factors related to cardiovascular disease, where there's old age, smoking, diabetes, hypertension, uh, blood pressure with a systolic of more than 160, diastolic more than 100, venous thromboembolism, women with a history of VTE, not receiving anticoagulation, having an acute embolic event, known thrombogenic mutations like factor V laden mutation, thrombophilia, and so on, known ischemic heart disease, having a history of stroke, complicated valvular heart disease. Then having um, current breast cancer, cirrhosis, migraine with an aura, because that leads to stroke-related uh, uh, complication, hepatocellular genoma or malignant hepatoma. So these are the absolute contraindications which you all should know and learn. Uh, now coming to the medical issues where you you don't you have to you know consider where you have to prescribe the medication or not. Thrombophilia and thrombosis, use of OCP in women with inherited thrombophilia or prior thrombotic event requires comparison with uh, comparison of individual thrombosis risk and the risk of pregnancy and postpartum for that woman. Okay, so if uh, it is said that having a thrombotic event with pregnancy and postpartum is far more than having OCP for that reason. There are no known interaction between OCP and warfarin, so no contraindication to OCP use in women with indications for oral anticoagulants, but there is a, there is a few data which says that there is a risk of non-vitamin K and P antagonist oral anticoagulation agents. So be careful with that. And generally, women with acute DVT requiring anticoagulation use, progestin only or other contraceptive method use, method should be used. Estrogen should be avoided. 
Then neurological diseases. There are certain neurological diseases that impact the contraceptive use, sorry, which include headaches, seizure disorders. So headaches and migraines should be accurately diagnosed um, because uh, it is essential if you are giving a contraceptive counseling to such patients. As you know, the migraines and exogenous um, estrogen use independently increase the risk of stroke and compound that risk when both are happening together. So migraine has an independent uh, stroke risk. And when you're giving estrogen along with that, so uh, stroke risk will be increased. So women with tension and cluster headache can safely be started on OCPs with, with appropriate follow-up to assess any worsening of headache symptoms or any change in type of headache. And if new headaches develop, they are consistent with migraine, then patients should be uh, discontinuing the OCP, especially if the patient develops an aura with the migraine. Uh, or a secondary risk factor for stroke, like age more than 35, or develops hypertension and so on. Then coming to the seizure disorders, women with seizure disorders require effective contraception as pregnancy itself may worsen the seizures and have negative effect on maternal and fetal outcomes. So fetal exposure, uh, furthermore, the fetal exposure to certain anti-epileptic medications can increase the risk of fetal malformations by two to three fold. So there is, this is not really a contra, uh, there's no con, not a contraindication to the OCPs. Having a seizure disorder does not mean that OCP cannot be used. Some anti-seizure medications induce hepatic enzymes that increase the metabolism of OCP steroids, which then increase the risk of breakthrough bleeding or breakthrough, um, I mean, breakthrough ovulation, vaginal bleeding and contraceptive failure. In that case, it becomes dangerous. So uh, I think checking the anti-epileptic a medication level in the blood is going to be more safe and more helpful in such conditions. Then there are GI disorders. There is no absolute contraindication to OCP use in IBD, uh, uh, inflammatory bowel disease. Lower or no estrogen containing compounds are preferred and those with known thrombotic tendencies may benefit from alternative methods of contraception. There is strong relationship with hepatic adenomas and use of progestin only compounds so contraceptive OCPs are contraindicated in such patients. OCP use does not appear to be associated with the development of hepatocellular carcinoma. So you see the, the progestin component is going to be safe in such conditions. Uh, then diabetes uh, mellitus, use of OCPs is acceptable unless there is evidence of microvascular disease or established atherosclerosis or vascular disease. Use of low dose estrogen or progestin only component compounds has been recommended because of multiple predisposing factors uh, towards thromboembolism. Then bariatric surgery. The year following bariatric surgery represents a time of substantial change in the GI function, nutrient absorption, and drug metabolism. Because of the risk of malabsorption, OC, uh, OCPs and progestin only pills should be used cautiously. And if at all, with a preference for non-oral hormonal contraceptive contraception or non-hormonal method, because there is a chance of pill failure and contraceptive failure because of the varying GI absorption capacity. Then obesity. Obesity increases the risk of cardiovascular disease, stroke, and thromboembolism independently, right? So the risk is further elevated by independent characteristics such as age and smoking. And contraceptive selection for women with obesity must account for the biologic impact of obesity on thromboembolic risk, medical comorbidities, and other risk factors, especially with estrogen-containing contraceptives uh, that also increase the risk of thromboembolism. So you, again, you have to assess this, these patients and consider other risk factors for that and then decide if, you, if this woman would benefit from oral contraceptive or not. Now is the topic of effect on cancer development, and uh, it's going to be uh, here. I'm going to describe different types of cancers related to the OCPs, the the fear of having those cancers. OCPs overall, uh, with regard to the overall cancer risk, OCPs do not increase overall risk of cancer. Long-term cancer risk and benefits were evaluated in two different observational studies: Royal College of General Practitioners Oral Contraceptive Study. Uh, has studied 46,000 women, and UK Biobank study has studies, studied more than 2,50,000 2, 2, women that followed participants for more than uh, 80 years. 
Use of OCPs was associated with protection against ovarian, endometrial, and colorectal cancers. Breast and cervical cancer risk temporarily increased with current or recent uh, use of OCPs, but was outweighed by the above oncoprotective effects, which persisted for over 30 years in both studies. Talking about the breast cancer risk, OCPs are associated with little or no increased risk of breast cancer. Any effect appears to be temporary and limited to current uh, or recent OCP use only, and many epidemiologic studies demonstrate no association as such. Uh, for women with breast cancer susceptibility genes, that is BRCA or a family history of breast cancer, may safely use OCPs because they have found to be uh, rather more protective. Then uh, cervical cancer, long-term cervical cancer risk does not appear to increase uh, among the OCP users compared with non-users, and the incidence rate ratio is 1.3. However, stratification by time has shown that OCP use reveals that current or recent use that is less than five years is associated with an increased risk, uh, and then the, 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 the risk becomes, you know, risk decline with the passage of time. So recent users have a higher risk. Women with human papilloma virus who use OCP may be at particular risk for cervical cancer, obviously. Then uh, the risk factor is the human papilloma virus itself. And screening for cervical cancer should not be a prerequisite for the provision of contraception. So you, just take, you can just take a brief history and then, then you can just prescribe the OCP. For ovarian cancer, um, ever use of OCP is associated with a decreased risk of ovarian cancer compared with never use, and this protection appears to last over 30 years. Modern OCP formulation with lower doses of estradiol and new progestin types are as effective as older OCPs um, at preventing ovarian cancer, and OCP may be used as chemo prevention among BRCA1 and BRCA2 mutation carriers. So you see here, they are using as a chemo prevention. So this is something important to learn from. Endometrial cancer, the uh, OCP ever use is associated with a decreased risk of endometrial cancer compared with never use, and this protection may last for over 30 years. So um, in summary, now I'm just winding up the whole topic. Common patient concerns related to uh, uh, the impact of OCP on weight, mood, libido, future fertility, and, and non-contraceptive effects. In general, OCP use does not negatively impact these variables, okay? Uh, common early side effects of OCP use include nausea, breast tenderness, headache, and unscheduled bleeding, and these symptoms are typically mild and resolved within a few cycles, so you can reassure the patient. Um, Combine hormonal contraceptive, sorry, the, the this is OCP, which use, um, OCP use does not appear to impact the overall mortality, so you reassure the patient, unless she has risk factors, which you have to assess individually. Based mainly on the data from OCP pills, they are associated with increased relative risk of venous and arterial thrombotic events. However, the absolute risk remains low in most healthy non-smoking young women. OCP use in women with underlying medical conditions has been reviewed and summarized by the WHO. So please make sure you classify the patient according to that WHO category, and then prescribe OCP for the purpose of OCP itself, especially, and contraindications to OCP use include factors or illnesses that increase the risk of cardiovascular disease or thromboembolic risk independently. I mean, regardless of that, the estrogen component of the OCP would do that. And OCP do not increase overall risk of any cancer, including the breast cancer. Any increase in breast cancer appears to be temporary and limited to the current or recent OCP use. And OCP ever used decreases the risk of ovarian and endometrial cancers, actually. Uh, thank you so much. This is a long topic, I know. And I, I think a bit boring, but I tried to cover most of it. If you have any question. Thank you, Zareen. That was an excellent presentation. Thank you. Uh, um, uh, you know, con concerning the, the duration of, yeah, so totally enjoyed it, thoroughly enjoyed it. And I'm sure the fellows also, you know, um, patient here. I just want to ask the duration of therapy that you, um, they always ask about it. Were there any studies which looked, you know, um, 
you know, we always ask how, for how long can we continuously use these mm-hmm. OCPs? So uh, usually with someone, PCOS or something, we say, you know, until they, you can even use it for a long, you know, on a long-term basis until mm-hmm. the woman, the young woman decides to start early, right? Mm-hmm. So um, there is definite data on, on this, that the ideal duration. So what, when I was going through this topic, uh, obviously there were many studies which are coming across. I didn't particularly look for duration, but the guidelines which I went through, they mentioned that until the age of menopause. Um, and obviously there is, a, there is a need of ongoing screening for various risk factors and health concerns as such. But uh, apparently, they men- I mean, most of them mentioned uh, until the age of menopause, this can be done. I mean, this, these can be given right. for, yeah. Right, and this thing about, I think it's important to, you know, this is a question that a lot of the, the attendants, the patients ask about risk of breast cancer. And I think this data has kind of, uh, it's very reassuring that that is not, a big hype had been made about it, but with the recent OCPs, this is minimal. Yes. Uh, in fact, I was also going through the Women Health Initiative study, the famous one, and uh, there also where they mentioned about different uh, breast cancer risk. It was minimal in, the, in that study with the, I mean, after the long-term data was uh, being reported. So there were, uh, there were risk, breast cancer risk there. There were incidences of breast cancers, but those cancers were, I mean, those were not related to OCP as such uh, themselves. So this is right. yeah, you're showing it. Yes. yes. Hello, do you have any questions? No, ma'am, we do not have any questions. Um, and uh, I'm very thankful to Dr. Zareen for such